Um, so we're talking today about um, exercise, which is a topic that's really close to my heart and um, really kind of the foundation of what we do as physical therapists. Um, so let me just get a poll in here. So how many of you individuals exercise on a regular basis? All right, good. All right, so we've got a good start already, okay? And give me, um, just shout out some reasons why. Why do you exercise? I feel better. You feel better, okay. Healthy. Be healthy, okay. And who says we, what tells us that exercise is healthy? Everybody says to exercise, right? Everybody says you need more. You need to exercise more and be more. Well, why, right? Scientists, Scientists right. <laughs> right. So we know that it has all of these really good benefits, all right? So um, today what we're going to go over is the relationship between exercise and actually brain health. Some areas that are new and developing as far as the benefits of exercise on your memory and on how you, how you think and how you function, which is relatively a new area. So we know that it's good for your heart. We know that it's good for your muscles, your bones, all those kinds of things. Um, but actually, that's also really good for your brain. Okay. So let me just read this quote to you. So um, what if we had overlooked a drug that was clinically proven to increase cognitive function, so your thinking, um, hippocampal volume, which is the uh, part of the brain that's responsible for creating memories, um, in older adults, slow cognitive decline, um, and enhanced neurogenesis, so new nerves, new ner uh, nervous system synapses, um, and reduced beta amyloid in animals, um, as well as have other health benefits <coughs> with minimal side effects. What if we, what if we found something to that degree? Okay. Well, we kind of have, in a sense, um, in that exercise is found to be very helpful in all of those areas. Um, so a startling statistic here, all right, 21% of cases of Alzheimer's disease are attributed to physical inactivity, 21%, okay? Um, so that, n that number alone um, gives us some idea of maybe some, some changes of thinking of how we want to approach how we, how we live and how how we want to exercise and incorporate that into our daily activities. All right. So here's just a list of those risk factors. Um, as you can see, there's many, with physical activity being circled right there. Um, so that's that 21%. If you look at the others that are listed above there, so diabetes, uh, hypertension, obesity, and depression, all of those four things tell me um, exercise also helps all of those four things as well. Right, so we know that not only physical inactivity, but all these other things that can be helped by exercise, or what we call modifiable, um, are, are on that list as well. So maybe there's something to um, reducing your risk by adding in physical exercise. Okay. Um, this is just a, um, a schematic of what we call the six pillars of brain health. Um, developed here at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and it gets into those all six aspects are areas of your lifestyle and your living that are important for healthy living, healthy aging, and healthy brains. As you can see, the top corner there says to get moving, right? Physical activity is a big component of this six pillars. Um, so pump, pump up your heart, get into strength training, and also focus on balance. Those are all some things that we will touch on. Uh, by no means is this the only thing <coughs> Um, attributing to brain health, there are many other things as well. So as far as staying sharp, how you eat can also minimize your risk. Um, uh, social interaction, as well as getting plenty of rest, uh, sleeping well at night, and then um, controlling other risk factors that you have as well. But exercise is definitely one part of that, um, and one part that we strongly promote as physical therapists. So physical activity and dementia, what, are we, what do we know about it? Um, so aerobic exercise, when I say aerobic exercise, that means any exercise that gets your heart rate up, gets your blood pumping. Um, so that would be anything from like walking, jogging, running, biking, those kinds of things where you feel like you're actually breathing a little bit harder. Maybe even start to break a sweat. That would be the best thing. Um, so it, it can actually reduce your risk of dementia. So. Um, by adding protective benefits for your brain. Um, and it also reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease. So that disease with the heart, heart disease, 
Right. Um, which also we know that the blood is or the, the brain is supplied by a bunch of vessels and, and blood vessels. So by um, reducing that risk, you increase that blood flow to the brain as well. Additional benefits being you improve your cognitive function. There's many things out there that you say after exercise, you can actually think a little bit better. There's more studies out there that the more activity you do, the sharper you stay. Um, uh, when, we, when we talk about dementia and Alzheimer's disease, it can also reduce agitation. So if you have a loved one with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, um, a lot of times we'll recommend exercise, just physical exercise and activity in order to calm them down a little bit and um, behavioral modifications as well. Um, reducing your risk for falls. As we, as we all get older, we all lose a little bit of strength and falls become a lot bigger of an issue for us. Uh, so uh, physical activity and specifically aerobic exercise can help to reduce that risk as well as improve your mood. Right? Who, who doesn't want to have, start your day off right? Um, so pre prevention, when we look at exercise as a form of prevention, um, you can definitely modify the risk factors um, by, if you go back to that pie chart, right? So modifying your risk for diabetes, hypertension, all of those things modifies um, uh, the risk that you have. Um, so the amount of exercise is also related to how much um, brain uh, function you maintain, okay? So they found that the people who exercise the most, and the people not only the most, but the most intense, um, actually maintain their brain function and their brain size a lot more than healthy individuals or aging individuals in general, um, and especially compared to those with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that next point kind of gets right at that as well. So what this tells us um, is that intensity matters. Okay, so you could go out and go for a walk around the block. That would be great. But if you go out and um, jog around the block, that might be better, right? Um, or if you go out for a 10-minute walk, that, that's great. That's a great start if that's where you're at. Uh, but if you go out for 20 minutes, that might be a little bit better. Okay, so that's what they're showing us, that looking at those people who really, um, in their history, have exercised more, the more volume that they do, they're, they're correlating that to some degree with the, the amount of brain size as well. Um, and also here, not only intensity, but consistency, right? So that means, so they're showing the biggest benefits are over a six month period, right? So we see a patient in physical therapy trying to get them into an exercise program, trying to get them to move. We see them for about maybe two months maximum, maybe three months depending on the individual, okay? And that's, that's great, but what we really want to do is just encourage that physical activity for a lifetime, for a lifespan, adopting a lifetime habit of that. Because it's just like, um, the, I always hear the analogy, it's exercise is like brushing your teeth, right? So if you exercise one day, it's not going to last for the rest of your life, right? Same with brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth every day. Why would you just brush them once and expect to be good for the rest of your life, right? Or the rest of the week even, you know? So it, it kind of puts it in perspective. It's something to do as, as a daily part of your routine, you know, adopt a healthy lifestyle, adopt an active lifestyle. And we'll talk about some ways that you could potentially do that as, um, as we go along here as well. So we also know that improvement is possible. So those individuals that we do see um, with memory impairments, um, that uh, giving them an exercise program, you can also see improvements in their attention level, how well they can focus on a task, how well they can process, um, and the speed at which they proce process executive function. So that's th those higher level thinking skills, uh, as well as memory, okay? Um, so not all, these are, these are activities and these are um, functions that are unrelated to physical <coughs> fitness, right? So something you don't think about, it's related to brain function, right? So you think like, oh yeah, they they're, have more exercise so they can walk further. Yes, they can, but can they also think a little bit better? Can they think more clearly and process things a little bit better? And they're finding that they actually can. Um, so also that gets to the point um, the interventions can also help with physical performance. So, how well they can do, how well you can do your daily tasks. Um, also, 
physical performance and an exercise standpoint. So not only, you know, getting up and being able to walk across the room and brush your teeth, but also the amount of activity you can complete throughout the day. So, you know, getting out into the community and um, doing your daily, daily routine or shopping and all those kinds of things, uh, but also imp improves behavior as well as mood. So like somebody said earlier, it, it makes you feel good, right? And it does. It's proven that it has those effects and those benefits. Okay. So this again gets at that point that uh, six months is really the mark of, uh, for improvement for these individuals. So, um, and this gets not, not Alzheimer's disease, but uh, Parkinson's disease. So a lot of times with our patients with Parkinson's as well, it's mostly you know, adapting that lifestyle, really getting, um, finding ways in which to be most successful in, um, in, in executing that in your daily life. So what do you have access to? What do you have available at your fingertips to be able to go and do? Um, but same thing goes for here, not, not necessarily Alzheimer's disease, but also Parkinson's disease with that executive function, cognitive function, and memory as well. So across the span of the diseases that we definitely see here. So exercise. When we say exercise, that's great, right? But how much exercise do we actually need? Um, and how much is enough? And how much is, you know, hard enough? Or am I, am I doing the right amount? is a good question. Um, and these are questions that are still out there, they're still being looked at. Uh, but what we've found, uh, exercise volume is neuroprotective um, and recommended for all older adults. So what they're finding in these studies is that the amount that's listed here, and we'll get into those, uh, is the actual amount uh, that the CDC recommends and the American Heart Association recommends for all healthy individuals, all older adults, uh, but it's also what's been used in those studies that showed those cognitive improvements and those improvements in memory as well. So what this is, it's 30 minutes a day, okay? 30 minutes a day of that aerobic type of exercise that we were talking about earlier. Um, anything from walking around the block, okay, depending on how, what your fitness level is, um, up to, you know, riding a stationary bike or riding a bike um, outside. Um, anything that gets you breathing a little bit harder gets you, like I said, breaking a sweat. Um, then and it's 30 minutes a day and five days a week. Okay? Um, what that adds up to is about 150 minutes a week. Okay? So when you say 150 minutes, a lot of people say, whoa, 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 that's way too much. But actually, it's 30 minutes a day. It can be very manageable. Um, a lot of times if somebody says, well, I don't have 30 minutes, you know, time is a constraint, right? Who doesn't use time as an excuse? Um, you can break that down into 10 minute chunks, okay? 10 minutes is the minimum amount of time that you wanna do an exercise. Uh, just the way your body responds is, that's the minimum amount that's effective. Uh, so you can break it up into 10 minutes. So let's say 10 minutes before, you know, if you go to work, you walk around the block for 10 minutes or bring the dog for a walk or something like that. Uh, and then after, at your lunch break or if you're working out your, on your lunch break, you know, find another place to walk or do something active like that. Um, and then the end of the day as well. Just a way to break it up. You could also do it all at one time. Everybody's a little bit different and you have to find what works best for you. But we're definitely finding that that 30 minutes is what's, that's what we recommend for all of our patients, all of our individuals. Okay. All right, and there again, the intensity, moderate intensity. A lot of times in the clinic, we'll use heart rate as a measure of intensity. Uh, so there's a lot of data out there about um, how, what intensity you want to be at. Um, and I didn't get into that just because we don't all have ability to check what our heart rate is, right? Um, there are a bunch of heart rate monitors out there on the market. We, ha we use some in the clinic occasionally. And if you really want to know, I can, I can give you the resources that you need. Um, but really what it comes down to in the easy way that we determine how hard you're working is that scale you see right on the bottom there. So zero all the way up to 10, okay? It's a perceived exertion. So um, you can see one through four is a light intensity. So that may mean you're walking at a leisurely pace. Um, you're able to hold a conversation, all kinds of, um, I mean, 
so the light intensity maintaining a conversation. Uh, moderate intensity, five to six. And then seven to eight, moderate to vigorous. That's kind of the range that we recommend for most people. Okay? And that's going to be different for everybody. And that can be different based on day to day. You know, if you're more tired one day, you're going to feel like you're working harder. So it's teaching individuals how to uh, monitor how they're feeling while they're working and while they're exercising, as well as continuing to monitor over a period of time. So that six, uh, we recommend about five to seven is that appropriate range that we would like to see for that entire 30 minutes. And that might be something that you work up to, okay? Um, if you've been exercising for a long time, next time I challenge you to th think how hard you're actually working or exercising. If you use that scale, say, am I actually working hard or am I just kind of going through the motions? So again, because it gets at that intensity is what is uh, proven to be most effective. So if you're able to add in a little bit more intensity to what you're doing. All right, so now aerobic exercise. Um, whole long list of things here. And um, walking is definitely what we typically recommend just based on the population that we see. It's usually the easiest, because uh, you could um, usually go outside or walk around the park. There's plenty of parks in this town, which is fantastic. Uh, so that's usually the easiest. If anything, in the summer, you say it's too hot, there's a lot of malls that have walking programs, especially in the mornings before they open. You can go inside and walk on a level surface, not have to worry about your environment and things like that. So walking is definitely helpful in a lot of individuals, and that's the people that we typically see have difficulty walking for longer periods of time. So really challenging them to walk a little bit further each time uh, and, and definitely getting their caregivers involved is what we've found to be very, very effective. Um, dancing, swimming. Uh, each of these are individual. You know, I had a lady yesterday say, I really love to dance. I would go every night if I could. And so that's what she really enjoyed doing. And so we look at that, and each person's a little bit different. And I'm not going to recommend her to go to a pool and go swimming if I know she really likes dancing, you know. Or I'm not going to encourage somebody to ride a stationary bike if they've never learned to ride a bike, if they never enjoyed riding a bike. I won't, I won't make them do that. You know, um, it's all based on an individual basis. And again, it's adopting that active lifestyle, that healthy lifestyle. So we want to find something that you enjoy, right? Who wants to go and just go through the motions and not enjoy what you're doing? So finding that um, something that you enjoy can really add to how much you would like to do it as well. Again, make it a habit, right? So one year of that cardiovascular exercise, again, those same benefits that we see. So not only that six month time frame, but a year, right? So extend it out and it, um, really make it part of your, um, part of your healthy um, daily activities as well. Okay, see, see how much fun they're having in those pictures too? Yeah. They enjoy what they're doing. Okay, so then we get into some strength training. Um, Uh, strength training is very important because as we all get older, we all lose about 10% of our, our muscle mass every decade of life, right, regardless of what we're doing. So in order to kind of stay on top of that, strength training is how we, how we build up muscle, how we gain muscle. Uh, and the stronger you are, the more uh, reduced risk of falls you have, the better maintained independence you have, even as healthy individuals just aging over the lifespan. Uh, so what's recommended on that, if you look back to that other picture that we had as well, um, oh, it doesn't say it on there, that's the aerobic part. Anyway, the other part of that recommendation is strength training, okay, and two or more days, of, days a week, um, and involving all major muscle groups, okay, so that would be major muscle groups of the legs, of the arms, um, shoulders, and back as well, uh, just to name a few. Um, in order to maintain that healthy, healthy muscle mass. And balance, all right. Um, so balance is also something that declines with age over time. Um, so adding in balance to all those, um, <laughs> to your regular exercise routine is very helpful. Um, what's recommended for this is about three days a week. 
okay? Um, and what does balance exercise, what do balance exercises look like? Well, they can look like any of these individuals here, um, but if you're not on a beach anywhere doing yoga, um, you can just do what these list here. So these five that are listed right here are the ones that are recommended by the CDC, you know, in order to improve balance. So what it is, walking backwards, right? We can all do that. Uh, make sure the environment is safe. If you need to, um, if you're feeling unsteady, if you notice any changes in your balance, you may want to have something close by, you know, like a counter, I usually say countertop or a wall, something to hold on to. Because um, if you're feeling unsteady, usually all it takes is just touching a fingertip down. All that, all that takes, and then you feel a lot more stable that way. Um, so being something near something that's nice and sturdy can be very helpful. Walking sideways, okay? So walking sideways gets at those muscles of your hips that really um, help to keep you stable as you're walking. You know, we always walk forward, right? So those muscles of the hips, especially those side muscles, don't get as much exercise. They don't get as much activity. Um, so by walking sideways, you can activate those muscles. You're also having to hold your balance as you walk a different direction than you're used to what forward would be. It's a different type of balance. Um, so heel walking, okay? Um, heel walking would be like your standing on your on your heels right you're lifting up your toes and you're trying to keep your legs or your knees as straight as you can and you just walk forward okay so keeping your toes off the floor and you're going to walk forward on your heels um, the other alternate to that would be toe walking right so just the opposite so you're coming up onto your toes and you're going to walk forward okay those two specifically really work to help improve your ankle strength and your ankles are a big piece of your balance and so by maintaining the strength and coordination and balance of your ankles, you're really working to maintain your balance and really work on your, work on your balance as well. The other one is sit to stand, okay? Something we can all do, we do it every day. I challenge you next time though, every time you go to stand up, pay attention to how you do it, right? Do you use your hands to push up from the chair? Are you looking for something to pull up on as you do it? Uh, because sit to stand really it works all of the major muscle groups of your legs it's something we do every day, but if we start depending on our hands um, to help us pull up or if we're compensating in some way, we don't use those muscles as much. So then they get a little bit weaker, okay? So I challenge you, uh, let's go ahead, let's just do it right now. So go ahead and just stand up for me. Now you're going to pay attention. I should have had you do that before. Okay. I got you. Okay. All right. And then go ahead and sit back down, okay? Um, and if you had to use, do you feel like you had to use your hands? You guys are all too good. You guys. Yeah. Okay, um, but not only doing that once, right? But doing it multiple times in a row. Okay, so doing it 10 times in a row, nice and controlled, can have very good benefits in improving your balance as well. Okay, I should make you do that five times just to wake you up, but I'll hold that for later. Okay, so now what? All right, so we know the benefits of physical exercise. I've presented that to you as far as um, not only the physical benefits, but the, the brain benefits as well, um, and the mood and, and all those kinds of good benefits. So why don't, why then, do less than half of all adults meet those guidelines we we're talking about? That's 48% only meet, less than half, right? So we all know the good benefits, they tell us, they tell us all the time, okay, but why, why don't we? Any reasons anybody has? Lazy, okay. Unmotivated. Motivation, reduced motivation, yep. A lot of television. Television, yeah, there you go. Distractions. Priorities. Priorities, yep. Injuries. Injuries, yep. Those are all very good concerns. Injuries for sure, because you feel like if you do it again, you're going to hurt yourself more, you know. You work out too hard the first time and it hurts, so they don't go back. Correct, okay. So you work out too hard the first time where it hurts too much, you don't want to do it, ever do it again, <coughs> right? I, I understand that, and um, people look at me like when I'm look like look at me like I'm crazy when I say, well, actually, you know what will help that exercise, right? Um, muscle it can, muscle uh, fatigue or muscle soreness can greatly be helped by exercise, um, and that's a proven fact. It's not always pleasant, but it but it definitely helps. Um, but those are all great reasons, and we all have those reasons. We all have excuses, right? We, we know the evidence, it's out there, it tells us that we should be exercising, yet we always come up with these good reasons why we shouldn't, right? We're too tired, um, I didn't eat a good lunch, I'm too hungry, um, 
it's, the gym is all the way across town. I'm not going to make it there. Um, I'm too afraid of injuring myself or I'm too afraid of falling, which is for a lot of our individuals and a lot of our patients we see is, is the truth, okay? So there's a lot of reasons why, and maybe that's the reason why that number is so low, okay? Um, as therapists, that's the number that we want to see go up <laughs> just based on uh, we, we know the good benefits, and so we want to see everybody living a healthy and active lifestyle. All right, so these are what we call barriers, barriers to exercise. And these are real. I mean, I go through this struggle every day, right? I like to exercise, but sometimes I just don't feel like it, right? So um, obviously motivation is on there lower on the a little bit lower on the list. But the three most common factors or barriers to exercise um, are low outcome expectations. So what do you expect to get out of exercise? You know, am I going to exercise once and feel 100 times better? Well, maybe that's a, a, an unrealistic expectation. Or exercise, that's not going to help me. You know, I don't see how it could help me. So you're not expecting any outcomes, so you're not really going to look for those outcomes. You're not going to see them. Um, so that, that's a big piece of you know, education of far, as far as what we do is promoting exercise as a way to promote brain health. You know, that's something that we use with a lot of our patients to really make them understand that this, this can help you. Um, lack of time, that's, that's a big one, and I think somebody mentioned that. Um, you know, we're all busy, we all have other things that we would definitely like to do uh, that are much higher on our priority list, um, as well as fear of falling or fear of injury. You know, those are all big, big barriers. Um, in addition, reduced confidence when you're exercising convenience that gym is way across town or um, you know I don't have access to uh, exercise equipment um, fear of injury again it's boring <laughs> I think some, did somebody say that earlier maybe um, it can be boring right you say I can't recommend to somebody go and hop on a stationary bike for 30 minutes without them you know mind wandering or really wishing that 30, sec 30 minutes would come a lot quicker uh, so I agree, sometimes it can be boring, but that's why finding what you like to do is so important. Uh, as well as lack of family and friend support too. So if you're trying to start an exercise program and they're pulling you in all different directions and don't really support what you're doing, you're less likely to be able to, to maintain that program as well. So these, this list is why uh, we as therapists get to know our patients very well. Uh, we want to identify those barriers that they have and you can maybe even look at yourself and kind of in, um, introspectively assess what's preventing you from doing these things or from, from exercising. And that kind of gives us an idea of what, how we need to gear our treatment, how we need to approach the, the topic of improving, or improving exercise in general. Um, Self-efficacy. All right, so this is a, a fancy word for, and I'll just read the definition for you, the extent of one's strength of one's beliefs in one's own ability to complete tasks and reach a goal. All right, so that gets back to that expectation outcome. If you don't believe that you can reach a goal, you're probably not going to get there, right? So, and also going into that is knowing what you need to do to get to that goal. So if you don't have those tools, we call, it's what we call low self-efficacy. You know, you don't believe you can do it. You don't believe you have the power in yourself to be able to do it, uh, which is going to limit your outcomes for sure. Okay. Um, so self-efficacy and physical activity. Um, so the higher your self-efficacy, the more you're able to do physical activity. So the more you buy into what you're doing, the more activity you're actually able to do. Okay. Um, so we also know that it's predictive if you're able to adopt and maintain an exercise program. Okay. So we want to look at all of those things um, r related to self-efficacy and we look at the long term is, um, does this person have the tools that they need in order to be successful in the future? So those are all things that we look at. Um, so you can also change um, self-efficacy and see um, changes in behavior as well and physical activity. So it is possible, if you take a person who doesn't believe in it, it is possible to change that thought and that thinking, which is very important for us to know that we're not just kind of repeating ourselves over and over again. Um, so what, in the population that we see, 
uh, behaviors towards physical activity uh, might be a lot different than, than another individual. Um, a lot of times, low self-efficacy is a big problem. Um, they're presented with this disease and they're not really sure what they're able to do, right? So you get a diagnosis and, um, you know, your self-efficacy is, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that, so why try, right? Um, you aren't aware of what outcomes are possible, right? So you just think it's the disease process and you aren't aware how far or what things you can take back or improve on. Um, and setting goals. So making sure that your goals are realistic and they're in, um, you're able to achieve those goals. And that's what we like to assist people with as well is, you know, what's realistic and, and what um, do we have to work real hard. And if somebody has this really high goal or expectation, I like to say, well, you know what, this is what it's really going to take to get there. You know, because you have to know that in order to, um, to be able to wrap your mind around it and to be able to work towards making that goal happen. Um, as well as uh, working with facilitators. Um, so fa facilitators would be caregivers, uh, family members, as well as personal trainers. Um, anybody who can assist in, um, in f making this exercise happen. Again, support of family and friends and caregivers, very important. Um, all right, so one way we found to do this, um, is by a group exercise class. Um, these are the exercise classes that we hold here. There are also, by no means are these the only ones here in town, there are a lot of other resources out in the community. Uh, I didn't list them on here just because there are many of them, but if you're interested in any other resources that are out there, let me know and I can maybe try to get them together for you. Um, but any of the community, uh, community centers have a lot of group classes, a lot of the um, senior centers also, uh, the living, um, the communities just uh, in general also have, offer a lot of various classes as well. Um, and group exercise is one way that we can find that helps us to improve our self-efficacy, okay? So this is just a schematic here. So uh, group exercise has been very helpful and um, you get a lot more social support. So there's people just like you in the class working next to you, going through the same struggles that you are. So you have a lot of social support, and oftentimes they're cheering each other on, right? So I've seen people come into the class and having assistants walking with their wife or with a caregiver or somebody, and they get in the class and they don't want nothing to do with them, right? Because they just want to show, they want that engagement with their peers, they want engagement in that, in that situation as well. And there's cohesion um, with, the, with that group as well, a good group dynamic. Uh, as well as with motivation. All of that then leads to motivation. And then that motivation encourages you to show up every week. It encourages you to come back and to, to exercise more and to um, engage more. And you're more adherent to that program. So then maybe you can do that for not only a month, but you can maintain it for, for six months to a year, which we're showing to be beneficial. Okay. Uh, a lot of times what happens what happens when you start an exercise program? Anybody? You're sore the first time. You're sore the first time, right? So you're less likely to want to do it again. Um, let's say you've started an exercise program, you're feeling pretty good, you get a month into it, and then what? Drop out. Drop out, right. Life happens, <coughs> right? You either get bored, um, you find other things to do, um, and you drop out. It, it drops off your radar, right? So uh, by having that, that other draw as far as the social support and the group support can really help you stay more motivated. And maybe that doesn't have to be a group exercise class. Maybe it's that you have, this, you have a friend and you've committed to this friend that you're going to maintain uh, that exercise program with them. So now you're accountable, right? So you meet every Tuesday and Thursday at the gym and you know you do these certain things and you're able to socialize with them as well. So maybe that's a driving factor, a motivating factor. Having a partner can be very helpful. I know I enjoy exercising a lot more when I do it with somebody else. You know, even if it's swimming where you're not really talking to somebody, I enjoy it so much more if there's somebody else next to me. It also pushes you to go a little bit harder, right? So it encourages you to move a little bit faster. Or if you feel like you're slacking off or getting bored, it encourages you to pick up your pace. They keep you accountable. And it's really good. Um, so look into getting an exercise buddy. 
Uh, so tips for success, again, like I was saying, uh, exercising in groups or with a friend. Uh, friends are often good motivators. Okay, if they're not, they're probably not a good friend. <laughs> Get rid of them. No. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, keep that in mind as well, encouraging your friends as well. So say, come on, let's, let's go to the gym or let's go do this activity and, and have fun when you're doing it. And then you don't even notice that it's active. Exercise, right? Exercise. Um, so it makes you accountable. Also, finding those activities you enjoy. Um, I can't stress that enough. I, um, you know, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do it. And I can tell somebody as much as I want to to do 10 minutes on a treadmill and 30 minutes on a bike, and if they don't enjoy doing it, I know that when they leave my clinic, they're probably not going to do anything to that effect. Yeah? You know, I think sure. one of the biggest drawbacks with exercise is you feel like you're not making progress. Okay. How do you get past that? Correct. All right, so the question was, um, with exercise, you don't really feel like you're making any progress, and how do you get around that? Um, so what, I guess I would ask you then, what are your goals for exercising? Or what are your goals? Is there any goal specifically that you're working towards? Well, sure, yeah, um, endurance. I want to endurance. Endurance. Okay. Build up a little muscle mass. Okay. Work on my balance. You know, okay. All of the things. All of the things. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yep. But you know, it's slow going. You know, a lot of folks Correct. struggle with that. Correct. It is slow going, right. So you str struggle with that, that speed of how, how quickly you're able to improve, right? And that's why that is a, that it can be limiting, right? That six months period is where you see good benefits. Um, so maybe um, maybe there's something that you do. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> You've stumped me. No. <laughs> um, so maybe there's something that you do that every time you know you you walk a certain distance, you just get so tired. You know, if there's that certain type of activity, so you wanted to improve your endurance, why? Because it's more help. energy. More energy, okay. So maybe looking at how, how much energy you have, right? So over a period of time, so a month, two months goes by. Uh, and these are, these are small, and it's, it's hard to monitor because they're in such small increments, right? So um, it's tough to measure that. But if you think back to two months ago, right? So say you got really tired every afternoon by 3 o'clock after you've been busy around the house or after you've done your, your grocery shopping and those kinds of things. Um, so maybe you get really tired and you need a nap every day, right? Well, now, look, three months down the road, I, I challenge you to look back in the past to see how you were functioning three months ago, right? So you're not going to see those day-to-day -day changes necessarily. Uh, but think back retrospectively. Think back to um, was I tired or how many laps around the mall could I do before I got too tired and I needed to go home. Um, those kind of small things. Um, if, you're, like if you're a runner or if you're a jogger, it's, it's, it's easy to know that you can go further, right? You can walk further or longer, run or whatever. Those kinds of improvements if you're looking at fitness. Um, so, it, or if you're... Um, you know, exercising at the gym, looking to see if I can go 30 minutes and still feel like I have energy to go another 10 minutes. You know, those kinds of improvements to see if you can go a little bit further, push yourself a little bit further. And those are indicators that it is improving. Yeah. Yeah. That's where a buddy can help you too, I think. Exactly. That is where a buddy can help you, you as well. Yep, so you can monitor each other. And, and a lot of times it'll take somebody else to say, well, remember when you know, we walked to the mall and you got so tired that time, but now you can look what you can do now. You know, a lot of the people that we see aren't aware of those benefits regularly. And so until you point them out and they say, oh, yeah, you know, that is right. I, you know, I did have pain when I did that last time and I wasn't able to lift that, that um, box off of the floor. And now look what I can do. You know, I can lift that box from the bottom shelf and put it on the top shelf those kinds of things. Uh, so sometimes it takes somebody else to point those things out for you. Great question, so. Because I think that is some of the things. If you're not, you're not aware of the progress you are making, so then you figure why, right? Why do it? But look for, I challenge you to look for those smaller things that might be an indicator that it's getting a little bit easier for you. Yeah, okay. Great questions. Uh, so resources as well. 
Um, so the CDC has a lot of good information, and that is oftentimes the information we will hand out for individuals who are looking to start movement and to start exercising. It has uh, gets to all of those factors that we got to um, the aerobic exercise, the strengthening, and the balance as well as, as well as flexibility. Um, they've got the handouts you can print out on there, um, and that's definitely what we hand out to individuals and their families um, in, in the stage to encourage more activity. So these are what the recommendations are and see, let's see where we're at with those and see if we can build up to doing more of that. Um, again, with any exercise program, if you have any health concerns, definitely contact your physician and um, make sure health-wise um, you're, good, you're good with an exercise program. Okay. Um, and any healthcare professionals can help. Physical therapists, they're good at exercise, that's what we do. Um, nutritionists as well as physicians, so talking with your physician about you know, um, the uh, benefits of, of exercise and maybe they can point you in the right direction. Okay. Um, all right, and that is all I had. Um, more questions, yes, I'd love more questions. Is there a charge for the group exercise classes here? There is a charge currently. Um, the charge for the class right now is about $80 a month for the exercises we hold here. Um, and if you go back to the slide, the two different classes, there's two, two options. There's a, it's called, we call them move one and move two. So move one is more of a seated exercise class. Um, and what they do is they use a lot of resistance bands and working on strengthening uh, endurance. There's also some boxing involved, like you can see this gentleman down below um, doing boxing. But boxing is a really good cardio exercise as well. So that's one way we found people to get a good cardiovascular ex or aerobic exercise, even when you're sitting down. You keep that continuous movement going, um, and it's a lot of effort, and it actually gets your heart rate going pretty good as well. Yeah. Yes? You're forgetting to mention that exercise in which you're raising your heart rate will improve your heart capacity. Correct, yes. So that's the main reason when I'm doing it. When I know when I'm raising my heart, I'm improving my heart. Yeah, now yes. I'm telling you that this will benefit the brain get better. Correct, yes. So the question or the statement was that he's he's aware of the benefits for his heart. When he's exercising and he's working his heart, he's improving his heart capacity. That's correct. Uh, but they're also finding other brain benefits as well with that too. Yes? How do you see in physical results you can uh -huh. tell like you did before, I'm working harder, I'm doing I'm doing. Right. Yes. But uh, the the title today was to improve your memory. <laughs> I'm trying to right, and that's a little bit more, yes. So the question was, how do you determine if it is improving your memory, correct? Yeah. Um, that's a little bit more challenging, right? Um, and again, maybe it's something not that you notice, but maybe your loved ones notice. Maybe your family members notice that you're able to um, think more critically about things, or you're able to remember smaller things or items. Um, whatever that may be, they may be able to tell you, or um, you seem a little bit more at ease today, or less agit a lot of agitation is what we see with Alzheimer's disease um, later stages as well. So maybe they could point that out as well. Um, one uh, one comment that we anecdotally get from caregivers are that, especially with the more advanced stages of Alzheimer's disease, after they go through physical therapy, they have more spontaneous movement. Okay, so now instead of depending on their caregiver to get up and walk across the room and get them a glass of water, they will now get up themselves and go and get it. Okay, so before they wouldn't have done that activity. You know, so spontaneously they'll be able to get up and to move around a little bit better. And that's anecdotal, so there, I don't know that there's research to support that, but that's some input that we've had from caregivers as well to know that it is improving individuals in those later stages as well. Yep. Question in uh, Elko? Elko? Yep. Mm -hmm. Institute. Yep. And anybody can go online and order this book for free and it has some great balancing exercises, um, different things and ways to keep track. It's a really nice book. I don't know, have you seen that book before? <laughs> yes, yes, we have, yes. That is a great book. They've got a lot of good exercises in there. 
Yes. And, and then they have a phone number, but if I want, I can give you that phone number. Yeah. 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 I think yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And I think we also have that resource in the library as well. Um, and I think there are probably, there are also handouts in the library too. So if you want quick access to it, head on up there today afterwards, fourth floor. Um, and they should be able, I think they have probably a couple, of, if not multiples of them. Yep. Uh, what about the computer programs to improve memory? <laughs> the question was about computer programs that improve memory. Um, that is not my area of expertise. <laughs> Um, and I don't know, there are some varying um, findings with that, I think. Um, I, can, I don't know that I could recommend any certain program, but there are some that are helpful out there. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't point you in the right direction with that. Yes? In, the, um, in your uh, six pillars, mm -hmm. one is keep sharp, and it says yes. uh, play, learn, and study. Yes. Any particular activities? I mean, is it learning a language? Right. So that like could be, things. yes, that could be anything. So it's anything from like doing uh, puzzles or crossword puzzles or learning really something helpful? new. I've heard that they don't really. Um, it's, it's variable um, and it depends. It's just something to keep your mind active. Okay. So something you have to think critically about um, is the most helpful. So like you said, TV is a big limiting factor. So TV takes a lot less thought than doing a crossword puzzle. Okay, so keeping your mind engaged, and I don't know that it matters what you do, just as long as you're doing something to keep your mind working. You know, keep it active and keep it sharp as well. So I don't know that there's any certain one that's more beneficial than the other. Again, it's probably what you enjoy doing, right? So if you don't enjoy crossword puzzles, or I've never been good at crossword puzzles, so I think I'd still be horrible at crossword puzzles. Um, 10 years down the road, so I, I don't know um, that there's any specific one that would be most recommended. Yes? Well, they say that if you do different things, like instead of reading the same type of book all the time, mm -hmm. read different types of books. Yes. Uh, and if it's games, try different games. So right. You used to do crossword puzzles and then maybe try Sudoku. Okay. Just different things that, you know, just right. change up your, your memory. Okay. Yeah, so the comment was that um, recommending to do many different things. So to change your thought process. So if you tend to do a lot of crossword puzzles, maybe change it up and do maybe something with numbers or Sudoku or something, just so you're able to change that focus a little bit and you don't get so once, when you practice something and you practice it a lot, you get good at it, right? So now expand that a little bit and uh, transfer it over to something else that might be a little bit more challenging. So once you've overcome that challenge, find a new challenge or mix it up as well. And Yes. Does the elliptical machine exercise all your muscles? Okay. Yep. So the question was, does the elliptical machine exercise all your muscles? Is that right? Um, yes, it does actually. Uh, well, I wouldn't say all your muscles, but it, ma it exercises all the major muscle groups. Um, so it's actually a very good one. So you're not only using your legs on the elliptical, but you're also using your arms. So what's good about that is you recruit more muscle groups and you actually increase your heart rate. Your heart rate will increase faster if you're using more muscle groups. So that's why using the arms and the legs will feel more challenging. You know, somebody can, um, I've had somebody say, well, I can walk on the treadmill, no problem. But then I get on the elliptical and I just, I just can't t um, tolerate it or I just can't continue doing it because it is that much more challenging, especially when you add in using your arms. And if there's any resistance on it as well, it will make a big difference. How does housework fit into it? Some of the housework is pretty Correct. So the question was, how does housework fit into it? And housework is definitely something, an activity that we can that we recommend for individuals. So um, you're right because it can be very strenuous, um, and there's different um, intensities of different types of activity levels. So if you know if you're pushing a vacuum versus um, standing and doing dishes, it's different. But you're still standing and you're still using those muscles as well. Um, so housework can definitely contribute to that 30 minutes of activity every day as well. You're right. Yeah, because you're right, it does get strenuous. Especially if you like it. Especially if you like it, yes. If you like it and you're going to do it every day, you're going to have the best and the cleanest house and you're going to be the fittest person in town. Right. <laughs> okay, so, yes. 
is there a role in your suggested exercises for consistent and lengthy stretches? Yes, definitely. So flexibility is a good is a, is definitely a component to to exercise as well. So is there a, a role to it? Yes, absolutely. Especially if you're finding that you get some muscle soreness afterwards. Um, definitely stretching and flexibility is always good to maintain. It also prevents injury um, if you are doing more repetitive type of activities as well. So that's a very big component as well. Is that better before or after? That's a great question. Um, usually you want to be a little bit more warmed up before you do any stretching. Um, so I usually say after, unless there's something that's really bothering you when you are active. You know, if you're, if you're feeling like a tightness or a muscle cramp or something, then, then do it before. Um, or if you have soreness from the day before, <laughs> that muscle pain or uh, uh, yeah, muscle soreness from before, you can also do stretching before. But I would say it's most effective when your muscles are warmed up and have had that blood flow to them. So doing it after, you're gonna get the best benefit. Yes? In your physical activity guidelines mm -hmm. slide, you, it was 30 minutes five days a week, uh, mm -hmm. 20 or 25 minutes three days a week, and then, that was, or, and then, and high intensity. What does that say? Yeah. So, or. So yes. Okay. Right. So this gets at, so that gets at that intensity piece. So if you are doing higher intensity exercise, um, so say it's like vigorous, so you're at an eight to nine out of 10. Um, you can actually do less. It's five minutes less, but it's still less. Um, so it says 25 minutes of higher intensity. So that would be, um, so you could see the picture of that guy at the 30 minute mark is walking his dog. So that may be your 30 minutes of that moderate intensity, where the higher intensity would be more like a jogging, um, you know, like lap swimming, um, maybe some dancing, might be higher intensity as well. Um, but based on this scale right here, that would be more in the seven to nine range on that level. So it actually, so the higher intensity you do, the less um, fewer, the less number of minutes that you need to accumulate. You can always do more. If you're enjoying it, why not do more, right? So again, getting at that piece where more is, is sometimes better. Yes, question. I had read recently where setting is detrimental no matter if you do exercise. That. So you heard that sitting was detrimental whether you exercise or not. Yes. There okay. seems to be something about setting that is detrimental to us. Sitting, yes. That is correct, right? So um, we, we promote physical activity, right? So with that 30 minutes of moderate intensity. But it, you're right, it definitely is more than that in adopting an active lifestyle. Um, so for those individuals who could do a 30 minute exercise program, but then for the rest of the 23 and a half hours are sitting on the couch and not moving, that's definitely detrimental. Yes. Um, so the more you're sitting and the longer periods of time you're sitting, yes, um, definitely want to encourage that activity, you know, um, minimizing the amount of time in front of that TV as well. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. They even infer that if, if you could be sitting and talking, it's better to stand up and talk. Okay. Yeah. Try so to avoid sitting. Ah, okay. So sitting and talking versus standing and talking be better to be standing. I mean, you are using more muscles and you are using your balance as well as you stand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a point where you can't stand all day, right? <laughs> Everybody needs to sit down once in a while. So. Mm -hmm. Like heart medication. Correct. And yep. that slows down your heart rate, mm -hmm. and it's very different when you feel like, you know, you're zoned out. Mm -hmm. um, and they have these um, circulation machines, you know, mm -hmm. you stand on them. Okay. And it circulates the, um, your blood. Uh -huh. Is that good? Is that, does that okay. count as, like, activity? <laughs> Right, so the question was, right, so with medications, they lower your, your rest or your heart rate, right? So, and that's what we see. That's why we like to use this scale on the bottom here um, to, because a lot of our patients are on those medications that lower your heart rate. Um, and you just can't see a change in heart rate. So that's why using a perceived exertion, so they perceiving how hard they're working, uh, is, is more useful for us versus heart rate in a lot of our patients. 
Um, as far as the circulating, then the other part of that question was the circulating of the blood uh, using like a machine, I would assume like a vibration plate yeah. kind of, is that, is, does that count? Um, I wouldn't say that necessarily counts towards that 30 minutes. I don't know the benefits of that activity. There are a lot of claims out there that it does a lot of fabulous things. Um, but I don't know that it actually, we don't know if it does those things or not. Maybe it does. Um, but I wouldn't count it towards those 30 minutes. Just because you're not, you're not forcing your heart to work, you're not forcing the, the cardiovascular system to work, so you aren't getting that. Maybe it does increase blood flow, but you're not getting that oxygen as much um, as you would with physical exercise. Well, I, I was on education, mm -hmm. and I had low blood pressure, so I had a one for a second opinion. And they told me that it would be Okay. But during the time that I was on the medication, I could, I mean, it was right. a severe effort to just walk. Right, yes. So I had this machine. Okay. I got on it, and it just, I felt like I had to do everything. <laughs> okay, because yeah. Because it, it put the oxygen everywhere. It just flowed the blood everywhere. Okay. I was definitely Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the comment was just to repeat for the friends in other places um, that medication can impact and it did impact her um, to the point where she had no energy but then used the device and it was helpful. So, and those, I mean, medications, to, helpful to move and to be able to, to function as well. So if you find that to be beneficial and everybody's different and so if it was helpful, by all means, uh, that's a great suggestion. Um, yeah. But medications are also something important, an important factor to consider as well. Um, so if you're on any medications, that's why consulting with your physician is very important um, to make sure that you are healthy and that the medications won't interfere with anything like that too.